Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual non-deal roadshow. My name is Danielle Saul, virtual event moderator here at Remar Financial Communications. And on behalf of our team, we want to thank you, especially those of you in Houston and surrounding areas, for joining us today for the presentation of Generation Mining Limited. Generation Mining is currently trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange under ticker symbol GENM and on the OTCQB under ticker symbol GENMF. Presenting today is Executive Chairman and Director, Kerry Nall. Now, without further ado, Kerry, I'll hand over the floor to you. Thanks, Danielle, and welcome, everybody. Here the story of Generation Mining. We are uh, developing a multi-element mine in Ontario, Canada. It's mainly a palladium mine, but it's also got lots of copper, lots of platinum. It's got some gold and silver. It's truly a, a mine that time has come. Those of you that follow metal prices will realize that palladium hit a record high this year and hit another record high last year. As far as the outlook goes past those highs, in the this is mainly a palladium mine at current prices. And the reason that the palladium price has been spiking, I will get into in this presentation. But it's uh, suffice to say that I think that the next many years, palladium is going to continue to be very strong. And at some point in the future, I expect it to get less strong and copper to uh, take over in this. So we're, we're really expecting for the first half of this mine life, it's going to be a palladium mine and then eventually transition into a copper mine. And I'll show you why all of that is as I go through. We did a feasibility study. We got a 13-year mine life averaging about 245,000 ounces of palladium equivalent a year. That gives us an internal rate of return of 30%. And a net present value, I'll go in U.S. dollars, of about $800 million at uh, 1725 palladium. Palladium right now is about $1,000 an ounce higher than that. And copper, is we use 320 copper, and copper, of course, is, is well over 4 bucks. So very conservative prices. If you take more recent prices and still a little bit lower than today, the internal rate of return goes up to 47%, and the net present value in U.S. dollars goes to about $1.6 billion. And that's against a market cap uh, that we have right now in Canadian dollars of about 135 or $140 million Canadian, which is about $100 million U.S. So it's uh, we're trading at a, a, just a fraction of our, our net present value. Upfront CapEx for the mine in U.S. dollars is $520 million. We estimate that about 60% of that, maybe up to 65%, can be debt. And we've also have been offered streams to sell streams to a lot of different companies of just a small part of the metal that we're going to be producing, the gold and the silver, and perhaps part of the platinum and perhaps a little bit of the copper. With those streams, we can probably finance the entire capital cost of this mine with almost no equity. So that's pretty exciting for us. We can produce palladium for an all-in sustaining cost of just over 800 bucks an ounce. I just want to point out that we use the very, very top engineering firms to do this, Asenko and G-Mining. G-Mining have built four mines for Newmont. They've built two of Agnico's mines. They've built the big Millardic mine in, in Quebec and they the big detour lake expansion and the Lundin gold mine in Ecuador was also a G mining project. So these guys build the big open pits for the Canadian and the, and the American mining companies. I've been in this business for a long time, 35 years. I founded six mining companies. Of those six, four of them went into production and the other two got sold. All six got sold at some point, got taken over. Famously, Thompson Creek, one of the companies I founded, started off its life at 10 cents a share, and when it got listed on the New York Stock Exchange, it was trading at $24 a share. The Glencairn Gold, we had three operating mines in Central America. Wheaton River famously spun out uh, a subsidiary, now called Wheaton Precious. You know, I've done this before. I've raised about a billion and a half dollars for mining companies, and we'll be raising more for generation as we go ahead and, and, and build this mine. Uh, Jamie Levy and I have been working together for a while. We had a company called Pine Point previous to this. It got taken over by Osisco Metals. And Drew Anwell, who was worked for all the big gold companies and uh, was one of the key guys behind the Detour Gold, which got sold for $5 billion, uh, joined us a little over a year ago as our chief operating officer, and he's been uh, coordinating all of our, our technical stuff. And I won't get into all the different people. We're still team building, waiting for uh, a decision from our partner, and I'll get into that in a minute as to when we hire out the rest of the team. Board of directors, independent people, we cover all the different aspects of the mining. We have a lawyer, we have a, an accountant, we have a, an engineer and a geologist and a geophysicist. These folks are all the very top of their industry. Paul Murphy is the chairman of Alamos. Jen Wagner is uh, chief legal counsel and senior vice president at Kirkland Lake Gold. Phil Walford just won the Bill Dennis Award for the discovery of the Valentine Gold Project for, for Marathon Gold. These guys are, are really on the all top of their game, and, and they're, they're not people that we could really hire. They're just a, it's a real honor to have them uh, wanting to be on our board of directors. 
Location is super important in mining, both politically and, uh, and environmentally. We are uh, in Northern Ontario, probably one of the most active mining areas uh, in, in the world, uh, certainly in Canada. Um, there's two mines under construction here, the Magino and the Hard Rock mine. Uh, the Hart Gold mine went into production a couple of years ago. Alamos uh, keeps expanding its Island Gold mine. This uh, on the top left there, the Impala Platinum uh, Lactazil mine, they, they bought that off a Canadian company for a billion dollars a couple of years ago. Anyways, and, and the Hemlo, the big Hemlo gold mine is just down the road from us. And, and we've also got, uh, so as a result of all this mining activity, the local communities and the First Nations tend to be very, very pro-mining. The, the, the money that they live on, the First Nations and the communities, tends to come from the mining uh, because they, they used to be a pulp and paper area, but of course pulp and paper has been decimated. So it's, uh, it's really focused on, on mining in this, in this region right now. And another nice thing about it is, uh, is where we are in terms of infrastructure, uh, way better than the majority of mines being built anywhere in Canada. We're right off the Trans-Canada Highway. We've got a town just, just off the property. We've got a railroad. We've got an airport. We've got a new power line under construction by the government that's going to be providing 100% uh, carbon-free power to this region, uh, which is, is a big deal, uh, especially among European investors. Um, and, and I'll get, I'll show you some more information about that in a moment, but it's, uh, anyways, we've got the infrastructure we need. This is going to save us hundreds of millions of dollars in the construction of our mine compared to, uh, what it would cost in, in, in where, where a lot of the other mines are located. One thing I should explain is, is this company Sabanye Stillwater, which is a large palladium, platinum, gold company in South Africa. They own 18% or so of this mine. We, we originally bought it from them, and they have a one-time back-in right to, uh, to, to pay 31% of the capex based on the feasibility study, and that's going to be well over 200 million Canadian dollars, uh, uh, to buy back 51%. So they have until only till July 22nd, so about three weeks from now, to make that decision. Uh, they have not told us what they're doing. So there's really three things they can do. They could, they could walk away from this project or decide to, to, to par I guess, four things, decide to participate for their 18%, which I don't expect they'll do. They could back in and, and, and pay this money, or they could buy us. Whichever way this turns out is, is beneficial for us. If they buy us, of course, the shareholders do well. If they back in, we're pretty much going to be carried through to production. We won't have to raise much more money. So far, $20 million investment, we're going to own 49% of a major mine. Um, if they decide to walk away, then we own it all and we can build it. And if they decide to participate, well, then we've got a, a good partner because uh, they're, they're a very experienced mining company. So I, I can't really see any downside in any of the, uh, the various things. But, um, of course, the market, uh, the investors want to know what is going to happen. And, and we honestly don't know, but we will probably find out in the next three weeks. A couple of important things. So at our base case... Um, this this project has undiscounted cash flow over the life of the mine of three billion dollars. This Canadian all in Canadian dollars, um, and that gives us a two point three year payback. That is exceedingly short in our our business. At at more recent spot prices, and these are still prices lower than today's prices. Uh, the payback's a year and a half. And actually, at today's actual spot price, the payback is about fourteen or fifteen months. Incredible low uh, payback period. The bankers love that. It's, uh, it's, it's going to allow us to, uh, to, to a lot of flexibility in our financing of this mine. And this is why that, that quick payback, this is the cash flow, and this is base case. Uh, you can pretty much double those, these numbers at spot prices. These are Canadian dollars after tax cash flow. Look at those first three years. It's almost a billion dollars just in, 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 in cash flow from those three years. And that's how robust this project is. And I was referring before about the palladium itself. So we designed this mine to get as much palladium as we can out in the first half of the mine life. And the reason for that is we think that at some point the world will be transitioning to electric cars a lot more than they are. I don't think that's happening, you know, next year or the year after or, or even in 2027. But it is happening slowly and it will continue to happen. And, of course, electric cars don't use palladium. So at some point, the palladium price will probably come down. But in the meantime, it's got to stay higher because there's almost no new production in the world. China, India, all these different countries, Europe, are demanding higher palladium loadings on, on every auto, automobile with no increase in mine production. It has to stay strong uh, until, until we lose the gasoline cars. And even, even the gasoline cars that are uh, on the road, 
uh, any time between now and the next 10 years. About every 10 years uh, in a lot of states and, and, and different parts of the world, they have to do emissions testing and those catalytic converters have to be replaced. And so they need even more palladium for, for that. What's interesting is, is the copper we get. So at, at, at the copper metal, other than the first two years, we're focusing on getting most of that out in the second half of the mine life. And we think that uh, electric cars need a lot of copper. And the whole green grid that they're talking about needs a lot of copper. You got to get these windmills or solar or whatever you're doing, you've got to get that onto the grid. And to get it onto the grid, you need copper wire. You just can't, there's no real substitution. You can try aluminum, but you lose a lot of the electricity. So it doesn't really work that well. And then we've got all these other metals. We've got a bunch of platinum, uh, around uh, 40,000 ounces a year of platinum. We've got some gold and silver. We've been offered uh, uh, upwards of uh, 150 million US dollars just to stream the gold and silver, which is less than 5% of our uh, cash flow. So that's, that again, shows you a real, a real good sign on how, how robust this project is and how uh, we're going to finance it. You know, in the past, back when I was building mines uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, I mean, you had debt and equity. That was it. That's all you, if you wanted to build a mine, you needed to do your debt or your equity. Now there's streaming, there's royalties, there's private equity partners. The smelters want in on the action and they, they, uh, they're offering us a, 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 a secondary debt. Uh, there's just all these different ways that you can structure a financing. And we're going to be bringing on a firm to manage that process for us because it's, it really is uh, an evolving and, and ever-changing uh, system of financing. And there's more money today from building mines than there ever has been in history. This is the uh, table of the sensitivities. And I just want to point out two things on this table. Uh, on the first line there, the palladium price, um, if you look at today's palladium prices is, is, is off this chart. It's, it's around $2,700 an ounce. But if you knock off fully $1,500 an ounce off of today's palladium price, and you're down to around $1,250 here on that uh, top line, check out the IRR. It's still over 20%. Nor normally, to build a mine, you need a 20% IRR. But I tell you, there's not too many feasibility studies out there that show that if you take a commodity price and you more than cut it in half, you've still got your 20% IRR. That shows you how, how, how robust this, this project is. Another thing I love about this one is the copper price. Copper was recently up to 480. It's around 420, I think now. But at 450 an ounce, this adds $300 million to the net present value of this project. That's more than double our market cap. The other thing about a 450 copper price is copper pays all of the costs. It's a byproduct, and yet it pays all of the operating costs. All the palladium and the platinum and everything else comes out for free. So again, um, we've got this multi-element situation. We've got copper, which is a hot metal. I mean, Goldman Sachs thinks it's going to 6 or $7 uh, by, by the time we're in production. Um, that would be great if that happened. If that did happen, by the way, we would be a, equally a copper and a palladium mine. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be so much just a palladium mine anymore depending, of course, on the palladium price itself. I'm going to talk just briefly about palladium for those of you that uh, are new to it. Um, essentially, it's all going into cars these days. Uh, not, not all, but, but almost 90% of it. And um, it go, what it does is it, it scrubs out the carbon monoxide and the nitrous oxide, as well as burning uh, unburned fuel, which is, is quite toxic uh, in, in, to, to breathe in. The most important thing for us is that it's essentially required in every gasoline-powered car sold in the world. And that's a lot of cars. That's something like 90 million cars and light trucks a year. So it's a, it, it's a huge market. A, a, a typical car uses about uh, somewhere between, you know, three to nine grams. I would say it averages about five. It used to average three, which is one of the reasons it's gone into a shortage. And the annual demand is, is, is about, it exceeds um, supply by about a million ounces a year. And, and that's, that's the nut. It, it, and, and there's no new palladium mines being built that can offset that. The, the only one that's under construction is the Platte Reef mine in South Africa, and that's 200,000 ounces of palladium a year. That's less than 2% of the world market. This chart really tells the story. This is the last 20 years. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the palladium price has been in deficit for the last 10. What happened in 2018 or 19, uh, the big Russian stockpile, 
uh, apparently got depleted, and that's what made the price finally uh, scoop up. Uh, for years, the Russian government had been buying the un unnecessary palladium off of uh, off of the big Norilsk uh, complex in South Africa, and it turned out to be a really great investment because they were buying it at three and four hundred dollars an ounce, and now now they they had the opportunity to sell it at at uh, over a thousand dollars an ounce, and of course, when they when they were finished selling, the the price went over two thousand dollars an ounce, which is where we are today. And one last thing, I just want to point out is that uh, as we transition to electric cars, which of course don't need palladium, hybrids are expected at least for the next ten years to be more popular than electric cars. And uh, hybrid cars need more palladium, about a gram extra per car, because they don't burn as hot, and they they need more palladium to do the same conversion. So we expect hybrids, uh, A, to be the uh, real driver in, uh, in palladium, increased palladium uh, demand going forward. And the second thing is, is that, that countries like uh, uh, China and Europe have introduced new uh, regulations, but if you look around the world, countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria are just starting to do so. So they are using very light uh, uh, palladium loadings in the cars in those countries, and those are going to get heavier because their their capital cities, especially, are just so polluted that their their um, people are dying of of uh, and and they really need to to clean up their air just the way China has and and the way Europe has. And uh, again, I just want to emphasize that even if um, uh, we do go to electric cars sooner than we think, uh, we're saying bring it on because that's going to make the copper price go up. And that's why Goldman Sachs is estimating 680 a pound copper uh, by 2025, which is our first full year of production. And again, this is showing the, the metal that we produce that's needed in future cars. And the lowest dollar amount is the, what's happening today, and that is with uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, the palladium and the copper loadings is about 650 bucks per car. But if you look at the other types of cars, hybrids, fuel cells, electrics, they all use even more metal. So whichever way the car industry evolves, this mine is going to be a key uh, uh, needed thing for, for that, the, 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 the manufacture of those automobiles. And one thing I also want to leave you guys with is mining for clean air is one thing. But where, where does your electricity come from? Mines use a huge amount of electricity, lots. Um, run the ball mills. We're looking at using electric assist for our trucks. We're looking at using electric loaders. Five big palladium producing regions in the world. The other four of them all get a, a large amount of their, their electricity from either coal or natural gas, mostly coal. Uh, whereas Ontario, where we are, only 4% of the, the electricity on the, in the entire provincial grid is, is uh, carbon-based, and that's natural gas. And that, um, where we are in the part of the province where we are, there's, there's virtually no natural gas. So it's a very, very clean um, palladium production. It'll be the cleanest in the world. And that's really important. Um, it doesn't seem to be as important in North America or, or Asia, but it's certainly important for the investors in, in uh, Europe. And, and we do have a few funds that are strictly ESG investors who, who have uh, started to accumulate our, our shares. I just want to compare, this is a table of some historical mines in Canada as well as some uh, some mines that are being planned in different parts of the world. And this is when their feasibility studies were done. What was the internal rate of return? We are amongst the top. We're in the top uh, certainly 10% uh, of, uh, of internal rate of return in of, of, of feasibility studies in the mining industry. Uh, if you go to the final column on the very right there, the net present value divided by the capex, again, uh, we are we are uh, the tops on this table. And uh, if, I think if you go through the industry and look at any of the mines under development, I think you're going to see that we're if we're not the highest, we're we're one of the two or three highest in in the industry. So it's uh, it, again, it's a very robust operation. We we really stand out uh, compared to our our peers. Lastly, this is our price to net present value. These are gold and uh, and platinum group metal uh, developers, um, mostly based in Canada, uh, but the projects are around the world. And as you can see, we're trading at uh, 0.24 uh, times. Uh, this is actually a bit out of date from early June. We're actually at today's metal prices and and etc. Our sorry uh, share prices. We're trading at. 0.15 of our uh, net present value. So we've got a lot of room to move. Even just to get up into the middle of this chart, we would have to, to double or triple in shares, share price. And I think uh, people want to know a lot of times, well, what's holding you back? Why is the, or is the share price so low? And I think the main reason for that is the uh, the question of Savanier and what Savanier is going to do. And I don't think it really 
matters what they're going to do in terms of our share price because I think all of the different outcomes are good for us. But nevertheless, the market wants certainty and uh, we should be able to provide that certainty within a few weeks. So just uh, getting near the end here, uh, I just want to point out uh, a couple things. One is, is how proud I am of our team. We've had this project for, for just short of two years. We did a, a brand new resource on it. We did a preliminary economic assessment. We got listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, did a full feasibility study, and we're two-thirds of the way through the permitting process. And we've done that all in less than two years. That normally takes five years plus for a mining company. This summer, we want to start the detailed engineering. We want to arrange all the mine financing. We're going to start ordering some long lead time items for the mine. We're hoping to get through our permitting process um, in the first half of next year. Uh, sorry, our, our environmental assessment hearings. And then uh, at that point, we can uh, uh, go for the permits. We're going to be applying for our permits simultaneous to our environmental assessment. So you can't get the permits before the EA is approved but we can apply for them before and have them all ready to go, and that's our plan. And if, if all goes according to um, what we're thinking, we will be able to start construction of this project uh, next summer, uh, and then uh, and it's about a, a 18 to 20 month construction process, and uh, it'll probably be in early 24 that we'll turn on the mill and, and uh, break it in you know, through 2024, and then uh, towards the second half of 24, we'll be in full production. That's our schedule. Uh, we've met all of our scheduling targets to date so far, so uh, we expect to continue doing that. Just a little bit on exploration. Even though we've done a feasibility study, we continue to explore, and one of the reasons is, is we're looking for the source of this rock and, and other rocks like it that we found. This one was almost 200 grams per ton uh, PGMs and 9% copper, one of the richest uh, mineral samples ever found in, in, in the PGM business, um, and we don't know where it came from. It didn't come from our deposits, so we're thinking it was possibly a, a deeper source, a sulfide pool that was formed uh, offsetting from the uh, the magma chamber. That's the, the geological model we're going with. So we're now, and here's the main zone that we're going to be mining. So we're now uh, going deeper, looking for a sulfide pool uh, down deeper in the zone. So we're drilling right now. We've been, we drilled last winter. We, we've been hitting some higher grades. We haven't found this super high grade section yet. This is what the open pit is going to look like and, and we're drilling in what's called the central feeder zone down down deeper here and that's where we're looking for the the richer material there's also this chornolith zone to the north which is uh is, is a bit intriguing it had some drilling 15 years ago they had a couple of nice drill intercepts they were deeper uh they never followed up on them because they were looking for open pit material but um we're going to be doing some drilling there this summer as well so that wraps up the presentation uh we've got about 140 5 million shares outstanding. Uh, we've got 13 million Canadian dollars in the bank, about uh, just over, just under 10 million dollars US. Uh, we've got some pretty good shareholders, Eric Sprott, Lucas Lundin, Sabanier, they all are significant shareholders of Cisco Mining. Uh, these uh, last, uh, Eric and, and Lucas and Cisco have participated in most of our financings since this company was founded. The directors and officers have been buying shares we uh, participated in all of the financings and also uh, been buying shares out of the market. Uh, we had no founder stock when we formed this company. It was uh, uh, the, the directors and officers paid the same price as everybody else in each of our financings. So that's the story. I think we're ready to uh, listen to some questions. Thank you very much, Carrie, for this great presentation. And yes, it is time for our Q&A. How does the grade at the Marathon Deposit compare with Sibanye Stillwater's operations in Montana? way way different um we are an open pit so normally an open pit um has much lower grades so the sabania and i don't know their exact grades but it's it's the it's the richest uh, of the palladium mines in the world i believe so it's around 15 17 grams or something we are one gram uh palladium equivalent just over a gram and uh but that's a typical open pit the the uh the the grades of most open pit gold mines tend to be around a gram uh, and of course, palladium is is trading quite a bit higher than than gold right now. And so, in that respect, we're we're considered high grade. Um, but if you compare it with an underground, but you can't really compare an underground and an open pit mine. They're just totally, totally different things. Do you feel other groups that could partner with you are waiting to hear what Sibanye decides? We've had inquiries from a lot of different groups. It's possible. Um, all of them have always got the same. Uh, reply is that we have to wait and see what Sibanye does. Um, we can't really 
be negotiating with someone when we don't know what their decision will be. They're, they're the driver right now, but we will know in a few weeks. And um, if they do decide to walk away and we do decide we need a partner, we do not need a partner. We can easily go alone on this. But um, we may decide if, 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 if a partner comes in that we may, we may want to bring on a partner and, uh, and take away the financial risk. Could we expect to see a commercial production decision from Zibanye Stillwater sooner than July 22nd cutoff date? I can't answer for again for Zibanye. I don't. Uh, we had been initially told that we would get an answer earlier uh, before the deadline. Um, they are still asking technical questions. They are still reviewing the information, uh, which tells me that they have not yet made their decision. So. Uh, I can't give you a date when it's going to happen. I do know that it has to happen by July 22nd. Would your plan ever consider mining the copper sooner or on a more advanced timeline? The way we modeled the mine is, as you saw, it's to focus on the on the platinum or palladium first and then transition more to the copper in the second half of the mine life. And one of the ways we're doing that is a lot of the material is being stockpiled. So the copper ore is being mined, some of it, but it's being stockpiled early on uh, and, then, and then put aside. So if we were to get a big spike, say, one year in copper price and, and a dip in, in palladium price, we do have that flexibility to alter somewhat the mine plan and focus more on copper for a year or two here and there. Uh, we are flexible that way. Uh, we couldn't do it every single year, but uh, we do have the flexibility to do it from time to time. Can you produce the different metals from the deposit at the same time, or would you need three separate processing lines? No, we uh, our, our plant produces all the metals at the same time. We produce one concentrate that'll be sold to a smelter. Uh, we're talking to different smelters in Europe and in Canada as well. Uh, but it's one concentrate. So all the material, all the metals report to uh, what's called a copper concentrate that's high in PGMs and, and precious metals. Who is Canada's top three palladium producers? Right now, the top palladium producer is a South African company called Impala at the Lacte Zill mine, which is about 100 kilometers from our, our project. The rest of the Canadian uh, palladium comes from, I believe, almost all of it comes from the mines in the Sudbury area. So that's uh, uh, Vale and, and Glencore uh, have the mines there, and they, uh, they are the ones who are, and it's a byproduct of nickel mines there. And I don't know their exact production figures. I think Canada, about half of the Canadian production comes from the uh, Lactazil mine of Impala, and the rest of it comes as byproduct from other mining operations. What risks do you see that can push back your 2024 production target? I would guess the biggest risk we have is if, if the world went into a recession, like 2008 over again, or, or and, and, and suddenly uh, you couldn't raise money. So that would be a possibility. Um, certainly if the stock market crashed, uh, it would be a little bit more difficult to raise money, uh, depending on where the metal prices went. If you recall 2008, metal prices were down for a year, and then they came back very, very strong right after. So I don't, you know, I, I can't say what would happen, but um, another possible risk, I guess, is that if the governments uh, delay the permitting, um, we don't think they will. They, we don't think they have any reason to. We, we think we provided very, very complete information to them, and we, uh, we're, we're happy with the data we've given them. It shows that it's a very clean operation. So we don't see any reason for any delays, but um, I, we have seen that in other industries and, and other even other mines in Canada that had their uh, environmental assessments uh, approvals delayed. So we're, we're hoping that that doesn't happen. We don't think it's going to happen, but that, that would be, I guess, the other thing that could delay this project. Those are the two. As I'm not familiar with the palladium market, what is the size of the deposit currently in gold equivalent ounces? So the size of the deposit in gold equivalent ounces is about, it would produce about 300,000 ounces of gold equivalent a year and um, over a 13 year mine life. So that would be, call it 4 million gold equivalent ounces of actual production. If you go back to the uh, original uh, resource, and this is just measured and indicated, doesn't count the inferred. If you did this in gold equivalent, you would have a number closer to about 8 million ounces in total resources. And that's because there's a couple of deposits on the property that we didn't include in the feasibility study that could be mined at the end of the mine life. Uh, one of those is a little richer in copper, so it might be timely for that. But um, yeah, I would say around 8 million ounces in, in, in measured and indicated resources. 
and then recoverable metal uh, of around four million ounces, and those are gold equivalents, and those are are rounded numbers. Is they're not they're not exact. What other uses for palladium will be prevalent after the hybrid model switches to completely EV? It'll probably go back to where it was before, and that was it was used as jewelry. Um, it was uh, uh, when when people buy what's called white gold. Uh, often uh, there's a high palladium. What there used to be a high palladium content. Now it's a high platinum content because platinum's cheaper. But uh, that that's where it, it was used historically. It's cheaper. It was cheaper than gold historically, and therefore it was a, it was a popular alternative for people who didn't like the the yellow. They wanted the the white the white uh, metal uh, jewelry. So that's uh, certainly where it could go back to. And and it's almost been totally eliminated from jewelry um, more recently because of the high prices. So that's uh, that's one place where it can go. Um, the other thing that would happen if uh, electric cars came along, of course, a typical electric car needs 180 pounds of copper. A regular gasoline car needs 40 pounds of copper. So you are going to see copper going through the roof, and this will become a copper mine. And then the other thing that could happen is is if uh, hydrogen fuel cells get popular, uh, the typical car needs about an ounce of platinum to run a hydrogen fuel cell. Um, there's only 6 million ounces of platinum mined every year, and there's 90 million cars. So if, if hydrogen fuel cells get popular, platinum is also going to have a very, very strong run, I predict. And so that will also become a very important byproduct to us. So the, the sh the, we're kind of covered whichever way things go. Um, if it goes copper, if it goes to platinum, uh, we've got those, and then palladium would probably, you know, shrink down somewhat, probably maybe to where uh, platinum prices are today. Platinum is mostly going to jewelry and investment today, and palladium would probably move in that direction. If a major wanted to buy generation mining, would it be a copper company or a palladium company? I think that because our copper is only a byproduct, it would more likely be a precious metal company. Uh, we have had inquiries from gold mining companies who see this as a precious metal operation and therefore uh, compatible with their suite of, of, of mines, and they're getting pressure from their shareholders to go green. So one of the ways they can go green is to start mining these metals that, that are needed for a green economy and also in a low electricity environment. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if they're mining companies in, in other parts of the world where, where their, their electricity is coming from coal, uh, that, that would also be a strategic move. So we're getting them from uh, uh, mostly from gold companies, I would say, and, and not as much from other palladium companies. But the but the, everybody's still waiting to see what Sabanier does because Sabanier, is, as you may know, is the largest platinum and the second largest palladium company in the world. So they are they are in the driver's seat on this one if they if they want to pull the trigger. Are there any funds or ETFs buying physical palladium? I can't answer that. There are palladium ETFs. The amount of palladium in the ETFs, the physical palladium, uh, over the last three years has gone down dramatically. The reason for that is because they needed the palladium in cars. Um, so the, 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 they were draining the ETF funds. It turned out to be the car companies that were uh, investing in the, uh, the ETFs as, as a store of palladium. And uh, so th those have gone down dramatically. They went up a little bit during the uh, first year of the pandemic. Um, I think from 500 to 700,000 ounces, like nothing material. Uh, and I don't know where they stand today. I honestly can't answer. It's not a big part of the industry. The, the stockpiling and palladium is not a big part. The automobile companies and the people who make the catalytic converters are buying it uh, just in time because, uh, you know, it's so expensive that it's, it's a lot of money to tie up uh, to buy it in advance. What type of financing options are you prioritizing at this time? Oh, we're not prioritizing any one over the other. We're talking to all groups. We're talking with people who want to do equity financing for us. We're talking with people who want to do debt. We're talking with streaming companies that uh, and, and royalty companies that want to want to get access to some of our metal. We're talking with uh, smelters who are offering financing packages as part of an offtake contract. A lot of lot of different balls in the air, and we, frankly, um, we have a great team of people, but we're going to have to bring out some bring in some uh, outside expertise to help us uh, sift through all that uh, once we know exactly what we're going to be doing vis-a-vis -vis Sabanier. So if Sabanier decides they're going to back in, we won't have to put up any money for a while. If, if Sabanier decides to, to not do it and walk away or sell us their interest or whatever 
uh, happens there, then uh, then we'll be engaging a firm to help us sift through all of these different alternatives. We have have uh, had literally inquiries of probably 40 different uh, organizations regarding various forms of financing. How deep do you plan to drill during the summer exploration program? Historically on this project, most of the drilling was above 400 meters, and I think our open pits go down about 300 meters. And more recently, we've been drilling deeper, and I think our deepest holes this year are, are we're starting to target around 600 meters, and and maybe even a little bit more. We're we're just we're we're following the geology, so we wait until we're we're sure we're in the in the foot wall of the of the of the structure, and that the, there's no chance that there's going to be any more mineralization. So we just keep drilling until we get through all the mineralized uh, portions of the of the rock. What should we expect as far as operational items to watch out for in the next six to eight months? So depending on what Sabanya does, again, that's assuming that we're going to be in the driver's seat and we're going to be the operator, then if that's the case, in the next six months, we are going to obviously continue our exploration, number one. Um, number two, we will be engaging a firm to do what's called detail engineering. You can't start building a mine until you get your engineering done. And some of the companies like to wait until their permits are approved before they do that to, to lower the risk. But we want to do it simultaneously to our, our environmental assessment process and our permitting process. So we're going to be doing that engineering. We've got bids from five firms. We're waiting to decide. We're sifting through all of the, the proposals we've got from them and deciding probably in the next couple of weeks which firm we're going to engage. And uh, so that's that's uh, one major landmark. Obviously, the, the various steps of the permitting will be uh, part of the environmental assessment and permitting eventually. And then the third thing is uh, starting to buy some of the long lead time items. And then the bigger things I think that will have a market impact are going to be when we people start seeing some of the deals we're going to be announcing on the financing package that we're putting together. I, and they, they'll realize that this mine is, is not only financeable, but financeable on really great terms then I, I think that they'll, they'll, that'll be a really key bunch of announcements this summer. And they'll see that we are indeed going to be starting construction next year, you know, following our timeline. Well, I want to thank you, Carrie, for taking the time to answer these questions. And this now concludes our question and answer session. Now, before we go, Carrie, I'll hand over the floor to you one more time for final remarks. Thanks, Danielle. And I just want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, I will uh, recommend that you go on to our website as well. Uh, Renmark does a great job keeping you up, but we, we also do uh, from time to time town hall meetings uh, where we get management on and, uh, and we, you know, uh, look at one or, one or another aspect of our mind and uh, allow people to answer, ask questions directly to, to not just to me, but to different members of our team. And uh, I, we haven't got any of those scheduled right now, but we will be scheduling some more through the remainder of the year. So please go to our website and sign up continue to uh, to listen and, and uh, we, we will be doing additional Renmark presentations through the uh, through the summer and into the fall. We've got a schedule uh, going right through to the end of the year. So if you want to get updated at any time, just go to the Renmark site and, and check it out. And you can you can sign on. Uh, they, they now let people sign on to any of them, whereas before it was just in the city you're in. Yes, I would recommend you do that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kerry. Now, once again, this was Generation Mining trading on a Toronto Stock Exchange under ticker symbol GENM and on the OTCQB under ticker symbol GENMF. Once again, I want to thank everyone in Houston and surrounding areas for joining us for today's presentation. We do hope that you stay tuned for future presentation in your area. And until we meet next time, stay safe and be well.